Okay, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I just told to Mrs. Diekmann, who is leaving the room now, she's missing the lecture of her life. <laughs> so, next time maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, in principle, I should be in Washington, D.C. now because uh, I'm a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and this very year, President Obama is addressing the National Academy, and we'll talk about climate change. There will be a chance to discuss some things. So you see, I prefer Bonn to Washington, and this is something. <laughs> it was a, a hard choice, but actually I, I made a commitment a long time ago to Andreas Rechkemer, so I'm here. There will be a compensation because Prince Charles will be visiting our institute this week, so I have to rush back actually and do some preparation because he's one of the people who has a long time ago and ahead of the gang understood that global change is all around us and we are about to ruin the planet. Actually, one of my key messages will be, apart from the slides I'm going to show, that over the next 10 years we will either win or lose the battle against climate change and it will be a very, very close race. So actually, try to support this with a number of, of, of quantitative statements. Actually, when we talk about the human dimensions on this planet, the question about what is the carrying capacity of the Earth will come up again. And you see there that this is an old debate actually introduced by Antonin van Leeuwenhoek in the Netherlands at the end of the 17th century. So how many people can be supported by our planet, by the soils, by the water, and so on? And he came up with an amazing estimate, namely that's the first one. This is a logarithmic plot, by the way. So you can have 10 billions or 100 or even 1,000 billions, but he came up with 13.4 billion people that can be supported, uh, just extrapolating the Netherlands to the globe. And it was an amazingly correct assumption, I think. And when you see a wild fluctuation, it's the wonderful book by Joel Cohen, you see in the 19... 60s people thought 1,000 billion people could be supported by the planet. And then in the times of the Cold War, it dropped to 1 billion and so on. This is a very interesting question. Probably we will end up, unless we do something like a great transformation of our industrial metabolism and agricultural metabolism, we will probably end up somehow below 1 billion in the end. So finally, at least stabilization of estimates, which is good for science, but not good for the world. So, of course, these are the usual suspects. I understand that Professor Lutz will speak later. What are the projections? Uh, around eight to nine billion people by the end of the century, peaking hopefully in 2050, something like that. And energy consumption, that's the right-hand panel, even in very conservative assessments, you will have at least a 50% increase of global energy demand by 2020. Most of that coming from the developing countries. So just learned about China. Um, so the question will be 9 billion people, and this is in a sense the inverse carrying capacity question. How much earth do we need for 9 billion people? Uh, it may seem that we will need two or three planets, actually, but this is certainly not a solution. So, so far, most of the resources, and that's almost a paradoxical situation, come from the underground, actually. We dig it up. So these are the fossil fuels, and you see the, 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 the portfolio of energy sources over time since the Industrial Revolution, biomass, and you have when coal, and of course, the, oil, uh, the, 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 the crude oil and so on era, that was the great acceleration the minister from China spoke about. The great acceleration was instigated and made possible really by cheap oil flooding the world market. Huh? And then a little bit of gas, a bit, little bit of nuclear, and you see that somehow renewables, a thick leaf for the energy portfolio, but it's only marginal so far. Unfortunately, it's not only 
true that we will run out of fossil fuels, maybe between the next 30 or 50 years, at least for oil and gas, but there is a nasty side effect with climate change, and this is the famous panel from the IPCC. According to various scenarios, take the, the red line, actually, as the business as usual, we will have another three to four degrees centigrade, by the way, not Fahrenheit warming on this planet by the end of the century. Unfortunately, this is perhaps not the full truth, because so far we have not seen 60 or 70 percent of the global warming already in the pipeline because of what we call global dimming, the aerosols in the atmosphere. So if you have an inefficient coal-fired power plant, then you emit not only CO2, but also sulfur dioxide and sulfur particles and many other things, black carbon and so on. And if we would remove now all these dirty aerosols from the atmosphere immediately, the full potential of global warming, according to the already emitted greenhouse gas emissions, would, uh, would be realized. That would mean we would have already 2.4 degrees warming now, according to the present uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases. Now, since we will add greenhouse gases, and of course, since clean air acts will be established also in the developing world in order to secure public health, we will see this additional potential fairly soon, but in addition, we will have more emissions and so on and so on. Now, why is this so dangerous? What is dangerous climatic change? In a sense, this is defined for the so-called tipping elements or tipping points in the Earth system. That's a paper Tim Lenton, myself, and other people from Potsdam Institute, University of East Anglia, and so on, published last year, actually. It's one of the three most cited papers in climate change among 12,000 papers. So I'm not saying this to show off, but really that more and more the scientific community gets concerned about abrupt, nonlinear, discontinuous change in the Earth system. So what are the events we are facing, in a sense? So you have for example, melting of Greenland ice sheet, but may even happen around two degrees warming. You see that's already in the pipeline with seven meter sea level rise as a consequence. It may be the collapse of the Amazon rainforest ecosystem by the end of the century, driven by illegal logging, burning, and so on, slash burning, but also by climate change. And the most dangerous of all, is the permafrost melting and the outgassing of not just CO2, but methane and nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide has the 300 times the global warming potential of CO2. That's a really dangerous substance. And according to recent estimates, one trillion tons of carbon are buried in the permafrost regions. It's 10 times all the carbon emissions humanity has achieved since the Industrial Revolution. If that gets released, we will have something like a runaway greenhouse effect. There's nothing to be done against that. And there may be all these strange feedbacks. I'm a physicist by training. We are looking now how the various tipping elements interact with each other. It's a research that is just beginning. But in a sense, through Greenland melting, you can change the ocean circulation. That has an impact on the biological ocean pump, which is removing carbon dioxide. That has an impact, of course, on a number of capacities of the ocean to suck up carbon and so on. So this is work in progress. Unfortunately, we have to get our acts together very soon.